to doing economic type stuff. So much of the parable teaching has to do with how do we handle this problem of, of material possessions and wealth and riches and all the things that are tied up with that. And one of the ways is, of course, Luke keeps nibbling away at the idea that, well, I'm going to trade with, I'm going to benefit, I'm going to invite people for which I get a payback. You know, so he's like, go out and get the people who can't pay you back. Uh, and Luke also recognizes with some of these scumbags that, you know, God's justice is not always clearly evident to us. You know, sometimes it looks like they get the better hand. And he, he sort of wants disciples and followers to realize that in the end, God's justice will prevail. That that's part of what we believe about judgment. But that doesn't make it always look that way immediately. Uh, and uh, he has some examples, and I have a, a quote at the end of a legal petition here, two very hilarious little bits. One is the story about this scheming steward who was defrauding his master, and the master finds out about it, and the idiot master, and this is meant to be the, the idiot master, the master's not God, remember, he tells the story to make the accounting books. Now, come on. You tell an accountant at Enron to do the books and give them to you after you've already figured out that, that he's scamming you. You know, you lock the system down. But he tells them, to, so the story figures out, I gotta get some friends, and how am I gonna do this? And so he uses what Jesus actually considers, and the Jewish law considers the unjust interest system, and calls in these debtors, and just simply rewrites the paper. And so basically he was scamming the master, he scams him a second time. And then you get this funny statement, and the Lord praised him for cleverness. Now, he does not try to teach us all a lesson of business ethics to go out and scam everybody. But he's saying something about the world we live in. And he sort of says, the disciples of the kingdom have to realize, what he said last week, of course, he's sending you out your sheep among wolves, but they've got to realize the world they live in. And this guy is an example. And, and then he adds other sayings. You can't buy into that system. You know, he says, you can't, God and mammon, there's certain things you can't buy into. And we, we could pile up a zillion Wall Street and other disasters uh, of people who bought into things and they bought into a little more and pretty soon they were basically in the camp of the unjust steward. The other parable, Luke also likes stories about women and this is sort of the final uh, one uh, that I'll end with, but it's the story about a widow who cannot get to first base with a judge because the judge doesn't give diddly squat for anything, for God's judgment or human judgment. He doesn't care. Uh, everybody knew in antiquity that unless you were a real rich widow, you could pretty much forget it. Unless you were a real rich, you, rich person, you pretty much forget most of things in the legal system. But she manages to be so persistent or annoying, and in fact, Luke's Greek is really interesting because he uses a verb which would be, if it was literal, it would be she was gonna like, give him a black eye, use him as a punching bag. And he finally decides he's gotta, gotta give this woman some vindication, so he does. Now Luke happens to tell that story in the context of talking about prayer. Not because he thinks you have to punch God to give him a black eye,
but because Luke often likes to say, well, okay, this is the way human beings work. God isn't like that. But if your imagination about human beings is transferred over to God, then maybe that's screwing up your life about prayer. Uh, but the last thing that I have down there, which is another thing you, know, you can only get from scholars because we spend our time rooting around in the sand and looking for this stuff, is a wonderful petition. And I'll read that and then we'll have our, our Q&A. But it's a petition, it's from Egypt in 303 CE. And this, this widow, it illustrates both the scheming steward and the, the widow trying to deal with the judge. Unfortunately, we have only, as with many of these things you discover in the sand, this is all we've got, so we don't know what happened. But here she is, she's writing to the Roman prefect of the region in Egypt where she lives. And she's desperate. Because she had not just one dishonest manager, she had two. So she, she's a widow who's been sort of really, she's been scammed by two financial advisors. Okay? So she, she's in, in bad shape. But anyway, this is what she writes. To Claudius Culcianus, the most excellent prefect of Egypt, from Aurelia, so her name is Aurelia. You give help to all, my lord prefect, and render to all their due, but particularly to women because of their natural weakness. Now, she doesn't know whether how he does that or not, but she's hoping that if she just reminds him of what he's supposed to do, he, he, might, he might decide to fall into line with the program, you know. So this is boilerplate, uh, widow writing to judge letter. Therefore, I myself petition your highness in full confidence of obtaining assistance from you. Having large estates around the same Arsenite gnome, this is the region in Egypt where she was, and paying a considerable, considerable sum in taxes, I mean the payments for public purposes and supplies for the soldiers. So, okay, she, she's getting in. Now, Luke's poor widow apparently doesn't have large estates and hasn't paid a lot of taxes. And actually, this woman uh, has a couple of sons who are in the army, apparently. And being a weak and widowed woman, for my sons are in the army and absent upon foreign service, I engaged as my assistant and manager of my affairs in the first place a certain secundus, and subsequently, Tyrannos. Now, tyrant. People gave slaves names like that, you know, Secundus and Tyrannus. These are people who are slaves or who are ex-slaves, and they were always giving them names like that. Uh, besides, thinking that they would preserve my good name. But these men conducted themselves dishonestly and robbed me, and depriving me of the property I placed in their hands, they never submitted to me proper accounts. Okay, so she hadn't gotten any, any financial statement about, you know, what Bernie Madoff thing her pension fund went into. <laughs> and similarly, by giving way in the business they conducted, they stole from me two oxen from those which I have for plowing of my same estates, despising my lack of business sense. And, and then at that point, it's fragmentary. So that just gives you an example of how Luke tells a couple of stories the stories are maybe sort of stock cars, a little exaggerated, but they're about real life. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you for getting us thinking. And uh, anyone want to come along for some questions, please come this direction. I might start the floor off, if yeah. I could, just to connect the two presentations. Uh, Jim Martin mentioned to us the struggle, especially in the assembly, with being the listener to these texts and how, as you observe yourself tonight, once a deacon or a priest begins proclaiming some of these stories, 